1992, I was a college dropout. I'd moved to New York City to become an actress and a writer. I was working at Fuddruckers Restaurant on the Upper East Side, and life was exhilarating. The world seemed to me to be full of poems and revelations about the human condition. I'd miraculously gotten myself involved in a wonderful community of poets and writers and artists on the Lower East Side, and things were just incredible. The bar was high, and I was reaching for it. But life was also exhausting. I was working 15-hour days, double shifts at Fuddruckers, at Fuddruckers. <laughs> and it was hard. I couldn't always afford rent. I remember the, the sound of the eviction notices being pushed under my door, that soft whoosh, and the punch that that sound made. And it wasn't sustainable. I had possibility and impossibility, exhilaration and exhaustion. And I knew enough at 22, 23 to know that I, I had to change something. So I applied for a different job, manager of the health sciences bookstore at New York University. And I did that because prior to moving to New York, I'd been in book selling, and I got an interview. On interview day, a woman came up to me named Mary. She introduced herself as the human resources manager for the book centers, and she was all frenzy. Frenzied hair, frenzied hands, a ball of energy, just incredible enthusiasm in every way. After we exchanged pleasantries, she leaned sort of into the table and looked at me thoughtfully and said, you realize you're not qualified for the job to which you've applied. Yeah? And I said, but I can do the job to which I applied. And she said, yes, that may be the case, but you're not qualified for it. And I said, at 23, so then why did you invite me to this interview? And she said, because you've said that in your resume that you're a spoken word poet, and frankly, my stepson's a spoken word poet, and you seemed like you had a lot of chutzpah, and I just wanted to meet you. In fact, I want you to meet someone else. And she hopped up and scurried into the maze of offices, returning with a very tall blonde woman whose ponytail whipped back and forth and who seemed to me to be all legs. And that woman stuck her hand out and said, hello, my name is Max. I am the director of the New York University Book Centers, and I'd like you to follow me, which I did. I don't know what we talked about. I don't know how long we talked. No idea. I was perseverating on my exchange with Mary. When I left NYU that day, I thought one thing, which was that entire episode was a hot mess, a New York hot mess. And I dipped right back into my exhilarating and exhausting life. Didn't think another thing of it. Until three days later, I got a phone call from Mary, who said, well, if there were a different job, say manager of the accounting operations department, might you be interested in that? And I thought to myself, well, you failed algebra in high school, but she likes chutzpah, go with the chutzpah. <laughs> so yes, I said, yes, I would. I would love that job. Six months later, Max is at my office door, which is something that she did often. We loved to chitter chat. We liked each other. We talked about her career path, winding her way through a very male-dominated culture in book selling. We talked about being from the Midwest, in fact, the industrial Midwest, where both of us had come from. We talked about poetry. She's interested in what I was doing. And at the six-month mark, she started asking me about going to school. Have you thought about enrolling in school? Have you thought about enrolling in school? Max at my door. And every time she asked, I said no. And every week, Max was at that door, that long body holding open that door, saying, have you thought about enrolling in school? And me saying, no, yet, nine, uh-uh. <laughs> Three years later, I graduated from NYU with my undergraduate degree. <laughs> and went on into my life. Went to grad school, went on, did all kinds of things stayed in touch with Mary and Max. And one time I was back in the city and had lunch with Mary, who again leaned over the table thoughtfully and said to me, you know the story of how and why it is that you came to work at NYU? And I said, well, I have some inkling, but I'm interested to know your version of the story. Please tell me. And she said, well, 
In you, Mac saw some potential, some spark that she wanted to oxygenate. And so she said that we were going to make a job for you, not that it needed to be made, but that we were going to make it and that it should be a management job. Because at NYU at that time, one had to be a manager in order to get tuition remission. And she believed you should have your college degree. Me, a girl from Detroit who she had known for 20 minutes. Here I am years later in front of you, poet, several books, a professor of English, my own students now with books of their own, teaching students of their own. And I'm also associate provost for diversity and inclusion at Boston University, where in part my job is to hold open the door, to help college administrators and senior leadership find potential, honor the potential, and ensure that the circumstances within the university are such that when we find that potential, it can thrive among us. I'm still in touch with Mary. I'm still in touch with Max. But they are with me every day because their lessons drive me. And the lessons, as I understand them, are honoring the potential in others matters. Taking a risk for that potential matters. Believing in someone when they may not yet believe in themselves matters. Matters a lot. And I think these days maybe matters even more. Thank you.